Welcome back, everyone, to Tech Advantage 2021. Your MC, Sarah Michelle, is here. I'm really excited about this upcoming session as I've had the chance to work really closely with these co-op leaders featured in the next hour, and I found them all to be truly inspiring to learn how their co-ops responded to the disruption and chaos in their communities um, and the creativity and innovation that transpired and uh, the morale booster. I think you're going to be, uh, a lot of you I know have got similar stories. So I really want to hear that right now. I want you to jump in a discussion. I just posted in um, the discussion box right now. So open up chat, get in there with me. There's a bunch of us in there right now. And I really want to know, um, you know, kind of in, in, in a, a couple of words, what your silver lining has been, right? This past year, uh, there's been so many, uh, for me, kind of some unexpected silver linings or unexpected consequences that happened um, to you, to me, and I know to you or your family as a result of COVID, as a result of being, you know, at home more. Uh, what has that been? What has been your silver lining? Because that's what this session is kind of about, is how our co-ops, our co-op families really rally together to support their community and and in ways that were just like transformational. And I know for me, a silver lining for me is I actually learned how to cook <laughs> when we could no longer eat out, which my husband is really happy about. So what are yours? I'm, I've got, uh, I'm gonna take a look here and see what we can get. Silver linings, what have been some of your silver linings? Jump into chat and uh, let's let's get those out that has happened for you um, around uh, this past year. So we've got, oh gosh, hang on, I gotta get my glasses on. Um, there's been a, uh, here we go, William says a silver lining has been uh, being able to participate virtually in activities across the world. Thank you, William. Um, what else, what else do we have from that? Yeah, I mean, virtually, this this conference right now that we're coming together virtually and the fact that you uh, can go back and watch all, any session you want to, you know, uh, breakout sessions and some of our, our keynotes, you know, through April 30th, that's a real benefit, right? Um, that we wouldn't have had if we had been in person. That's a silver lining. So what else? Somebody else jump in there. <clears throat> Let's get some other silver linings uh, before we get started here. There's some great, um, I know, silver linings for people that, um, that have really come up. And I think what's really blew me away is how, um, is how, how much this has really helped uh, teams come together in co-ops as they've really been uh, really dug into innovation and creativity to come up with creative ways to really serve their community. And so jump in there and share those. Um, let's get that going in chat. Um, so one of the things that we really wanna um, talk about as we kick this off is is one of the programs that is really near and dear to NRECA is the international program. And they also experienced major disruption this past year. And uh, if you've been in the international program, jump in a chat and tell us that. If you've had a chance to go, let us know where you went and what year you went. But to help us kick this off, uh, would you please welcome the SVP for NRECA's international program, Dan Waddell. Good morning, my name is Dan Waddell. I'm the Senior Vice President for NRC International. Almost a year ago, I was traveling to Papua New Guinea for a World Bank project. I got as far as Tokyo and had to turn around and return home. Our team members all adjusted work practices, stopped all travel and retreated to uh, work safe in safe isolation from one another and from our global partners. NRC International operations have been affected in every imaginable way, starting with a simple fact that our international program is being implemented in the United States in individual home offices rather than with our clients in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. To adjust, we adapted our priorities and shifted to higher technology projects that can be done from afar, while initiating the process to adjust our, our business plan to respond to market conditions in the changing international electrification community. In this last year, I remained in touch with many of the electric cooperatives and utilities around the world we helped establish years years ago. It was no surprise to me that the electric co-ops in the Philippines, Bolivia, and Uganda 
have shown the same resilience and concern for community during a pandemic as our cooperative membership here in the United States. Our partners in the Philippines, Bolivia, Bangladesh, and elsewhere have suspended power disconnections, offered free service for low-income members, and donated food and PPE to hospitals. I'm sure this all sounds familiar to you as the cooperative values and principles employed by many of our partners in these countries were introduced by American electric cooperatives decades ago, which is why the story you're about to hear may inspire, but not surprise you. Around the same time I was on a plane traveling to Papua New Guinea, a group of volunteer linemen from Ohio were working fast to bring electricity to two remote villages in Guatemala. They were nearly stranded in Guatemala City as borders closed and flights were, were canceled. None of, none of us realized at that time that this is going to be the last volunteer electrification project for more than a year. Many of us here in this country work together to bring them home safely. But as, you'll hear, as, you're here on the, as you will hear next from Carl Hoffman, who led the Ohio team, all of them were, were, were glad to, to get home, but they were even more excited that they were able to bring power to these communities. My name is Kyle Hoffman. I work for Ohio's Electric Cooperatives located in Columbus, Ohio. Um, talking today about COVID related issues that we've run into this year in 2020. Um, I was the lead on the Project Ohio trip um, that we did through NRECA down in Guatemala. Um, we went to the uh, village of Terra Blanca Sabol and we were down there to, um, to bring power to the village of people um, like we had in the past on two other projects and many across the country and other co-ops have been able to do. Um, going down for the trip, we had heard of COVID. Um, we were not necessarily understanding of, all the, of how quickly this was going to turn into a pandemic and the situation that it turned to in the country. Um, so we really weren't expecting any kind of setbacks um, due to the COVID uh, when we left in early March. Um, but shortly after getting there, um, some of us talking to our families and, and myself talking to those back here at the statewide in Ohio, we quickly realized that the COVID situation was indeed um, taking, taking, um, taking hold pretty quick and that we, were, we could possibly run into troubles on our trip. So um, talking to the other volunteers that went down and, and their hearts were in the right place and they said, hey, we understand things are going on at home, but let's try to get this project done. So um, we started to uh, very close communication back home every day, finding out what things were looking like and we kept forging ahead on the project. And then one day when we were very close to being completed, literally all we had left to do was hang up the takeoff um, from the lines that we built to the hot primary. Uh, we received a phone call about two o'clock that afternoon that the Guatemalan, um, the, the Guatemalan government had decided to close the international airport down and that we needed to head for Guatemala City as soon as possible. Um, that was obviously a, a big blow to the team because we wanted to turn the lights on the next day. We wanted to, we wanted to see everyone's faces, and which is such a gratifying part of, of the project to, to see that you've changed other people's lives. So we, we, we had to quickly say our goodbyes to the ones that, we were, that helped us, to, to Emory, to the villagers, and we started the long trip back to Guatemala City um, from Terra Blanca, Sabol. And we, we, we made the trip. And as we receipt, got ourselves back to Guatemala City, um, unfortunately, they said that there was no more flights leaving and that we were pretty much on standby. Um, and we were stuck in Guatemala City in a hotel waiting for, um, waiting for us to be able to leave. Um, those back in Ohio were, were diligently working with our state representatives um, there to, to talk to, to Washington to, to get us and to be in contact with the Guatemalan government to allow a flight to get us home. Um, so we were, we were basically stuck there for, I think, a little over two days in Guatemala City um, trying to get back. And um, ultimately, we were able to secure a flight back to the States and, and you know, and, and able to land in Miami and then fly from Miami back to Columbus. One of the great things about the project, though, even though COVID did shorten our stay and, and things of that nature, um, Emory, the local co-op there, um, utility was able to um, energize the village the very next day. So all the efforts of the volunteers, all the hard work they put in, knowing that every day was uncertain, uh, we were still able, we felt like, to accomplish that goal and, and actually bring power to those people in that village. Now I want to bring a conversation moderated by our MC, Sarah Michelle, to highlight some of the ways our co-ops have stepped up to support their communities here at home. 
Kyle, thanks so much for sharing your story about the last NRECA international trip uh, last March to Guatemala and the work that your team did there. And I can only imagine that members who go on these international outreach trips form a special bond, especially when you're all holed up for two days together near the airport, waiting for clearance to leave and getting frantic messages from family that the border's closing. What must have been, that must have been pretty scary. What was going through your mind at the time? Well, at the time, I mean, you know, you go on these trips and, and the groups that you go with are great people and, and their hearts are in the right places to do the right things when they're on the trips. Um, but there was some nervousness when we when we made it back to the hotel and we were told that we couldn't leave and, you know, we weren't sure when we were going to be able to get out of there at that point in time. So, um, you know, and, and that that's tough as, as the leader of the team and you're trying to make sure that everyone's doing well on, in their own accord. And you're also trying to communicate back home. I and mean, we were talking to NRECA and senior staff at Ohio's Electric Cooperatives and even had contact with some of our state representatives and, and senators in Ohio and, and around the country to, to get us the right to get out of there. And um, so it was challenging. And, and, you know, the kind of people we are, we, we love our families. Our families mean the most to us. And, and we sacrifice a great deal to go help others. And not only are we giving, but our families are giving us up to – to allow us to go down there and, and, and do these projects. And none of us want to put our families in a, in a difficult position. And it is tough to, to talk to loved ones and your children back home and have them ask you those questions of when you're coming home. So we relied on each other. I mean, we, we were a tight net group and there's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, when you have that tough conversation and you get off the phone and, Hey, you want to talk about it? And we, we know a lot of each other leaned on one another to get through it. There's no doubt about it, but uh, we kept our faith and ultimately, that's what got us home was that a lot of people were working for us in the right corner. And, and we got the phone call that we were going to be able to get out of there. And that, that was a great call to make home to say, hey, we're, we're coming home. We're going to get out of here. So, yeah. I can, I can only imagine about that call. But I know that um, you shared with me that it was frustrating to not be able to flip the switch. Uh, because you guys got pulled out before you could actually turn the lights on, but but you told me there there was a little bit of a victory, right? That you did get some get some satisfaction before you left Guatemala. Absolutely. I mean, anytime you start a project, we're working towards the end goal. The end goal is to see the lights come on. The end goal is to is to see the see the look on the faces of the villagers, and you know, in this case, Terra Blanca Sabol, that the first time they've seen these light bulbs come on in their homes or in their communities or outside their churches and. And um, unfortunately, on this project, um, you know, we were one day, I mean, we all we were doing the day that we were told to start heading for the airport was buttoning up. We were finished and ahead of schedule. And um, so we only had one span left to hang, and we were going to energize the village the next day. Um, but unfortunately, we were told, um, hey, you guys need to really start heading to Guatemala City. We don't know when that timeline is going to be to get you out of there. And um, we were all back at the hotel. And and we, we stayed in close contact with Emory and some of the others that we had made close bonds with. And we were in the hotel and we started to get text messages from, from those at Emory of standing in homes with the lights on and the smiles. And, and, and I think the cheers that was in the hotel, um, we were really the only ones in the hotel, but I think everyone around the blocks could hear us because it just, you know, it kind of puts a bow on everything that you've worked so hard to do and to provide these people with this with with a gift of electricity that we all take for granted sometimes and um you just want to be a part of that so yeah although we didn't get to be there with them you know to, uh, but we did get that satisfaction that's you know mission complete well it's so amazing we're gonna we're gonna come back to you in a minute kyle but i want to focus now on how co-op supported communities in the united states during the pandemic during the past year when the entire country went into lockdown due to covid and um Right now, we're going to highlight three other co-ops here in the United States that leverage innovation, teamwork, and community and relationships to positively impact their communities during COVID. Um, these stories have really warmed my heart, and I know they're going to warm yours as well. We're going to start with Don Bowman, Vice President of Engineering and Operations at Wake EMC. And Don, I want to start with your story um, to help us set the stage. Let's take a look at what your co-op, Wake Electric in North Carolina, did to support your community. We're very happy to be participating in a, a local project with one of our local community leaders who decided that they could take some of our stranded aluminum that we would typically throw away in scrap bins. He could take that, unravel it, and create these nose 
bridge strips that would go in homemade masks. So Don, this story kind of blows me away. Um, can, can you start with where the idea generated from to reuse stranded aluminum assets? Sure. Yeah, this uh, project w w just arrived in the, in the greatest of ways. Not only did we we find a, a local leader and, and meet a community uh, person, but uh, you know we we found this individual that back in 2013 in Wake Forest, North Carolina, he kickstarted a company, and this company was going to be making the perfect travel mug with the, with the insulation and keep your hots hot and your colds cold. That's what they did for the last few years. But when COVID hit, he really had a switch uh, go off that said that he needed to to help our help help the world. And uh, as he started to look at what was needed, as you remember back in March and April, we were all wondering what was going to happen next and what was needed the most. And we were all learning about the uses of masks, but we we knew we couldn't get them at a fast rate. Not everybody had them, so we had this big whirlwind of of home crafters that were going to make masks for as many people as they could and this was going on around the world but one thing that was left out was the uh that there were breathe holes uh, above the nose and so this uh individual was looking at what materials could he use to help that effort and he realized he needed aluminum up in in about this width and as he started to look at where those sources are from, he realized that the conductors that utilities use were really that perfect material. So after he called a local municipality and asked, do you have any of these scraps? Surprisingly, they said, no, we don't do that sort of thing. And, and so uh, we, we were the next in line to call. When he called me, I said, of course, I've got bins of it. These would these are scraps that would would most of the time we try to get into a recycling, but sometimes it would even go just into a landfill. So these were just pieces of leftover conductor that didn't quite make the span as we were as we were putting stuff up. As he came over, I got to meet the gentleman, and we together dove into the dumpster, found it, and he looked at it, and his eyes lit up. Said, "This is perfect." Um, now we fast forward 12 months ahead. And if you were to visit this place, you'd be just amazed at the sense of community that exists in, within this organization. It's almost all volunteers. And I'm talking about high school volunteers that are getting hours for, for school projects. I, I met a, a gentleman by the name of Richard, who's an 84 year old veteran that uh, jokes that he gets paid by cookies. Um, but he sits there and cranks out 1200 of these nose strips per day. And when you go over to the station where they're mailing these out, you see addresses that are going to Iceland, New Zealand, across the world. And they're essentially being done for free um, as long as the person that orders them pays the postage. But then, of course, you have that opportunity to pay for them if you want to, and you have the opportunity to donate. And this, this organization is being supported by donations um, by by people that aren't even buying the nose strips. They just see what they're doing. So I, I see it's just a great opportunity to bring the community together, give youth the opportunity to participate. Um, and, and it's really been uh, extraordinary for us. Uh, there's so much about this story that blows me away. I mean, you've got the recycling of materials, right? And the impact of being able to use that instead of jumping it in a landfill. But but didn't didn't this mad scientist Don uh, come out of retirement? Like, wasn't he actually retired? Oh yeah, he was. He had he had his side projects, but he had pretty much earned what he he was going to earn through his uh, through his company. And now he turned his company into this organization that does it essentially nonprofit. And aren't they work? Where are they working out of? Yeah, it's totally. a great location. They've, uh, as you know, the VFWs around the country cannot necessarily gather um, wh the way they used to do for pancake breakfasts and all these other things. So the VFW has opened up their shop for this um, facility, which just happens to be directly across the street from the Wake Forest Post Office. So they box these things oh up, walk across the street, and put them in the mail. Uh, it's a pretty efficient uh, setup. Yeah, what a what a great model. I mean, this should be replicated everywhere. We're going to come back to you, Don, but let's move on to uh, Laura Holy Cross. She's the Member Services Community and Marketing Coordinator at Barry Electric. 
And uh, we're going to get introduced to her story and how Berry Electric Cooperative put up mobile hotspots in school parking lots. Let's take a look. We met with the schools and work with them to put up Wi-Fi hotspots in parking lots for three school districts. This would enable students to have access to do virtual schoolwork, all while staying safe. So Laura, uh, talk to us a little bit about how the idea generated to set up these mobile hotspots. Well, in one of the many meetings that we were having during COVID, it came to our attention that we really had a need for internet access for our students uh, who maybe because of the uh, environment that they live in, they weren't I didn't have access to internet, so we were like, how can we help them? You know, we can't build internet to everyone's location, but we had uh, a Wi-Fi extenders here in the facility, and we're like, what if we put those up in the parking lots at the schools? At least it would give uh, students an opportunity to go somewhere safe where they could download their work um, and use the internet and be able to stay connected as best possible. So I didn't have to do any dumpster diving. We actually were able to order the units and get them relatively quickly considering, and the guys got them up and we were able to get that Wi-Fi to the students that needed it pretty soon. So I can imagine, uh, did you get to go by, you know, drive by some of those uh, school parking lots and just see cars and cars of people and kids doing their schoolwork and, I mean, what did that do for you to see that? It was great to be able to see the benefit that the students had from it. I have students and, and we did drive by and I made sure that we could get connected because that's pretty important. But yeah, it was it was a great experience to know that we were able to do something and to help with kids. Yeah, awesome. Let's move on to our um, our final panelist, um, Hannah Capozzi. She's the member and public relations manager at Grand Canyon State Electric Cooperative. And their creative story was really around collaboration, I think, um, comes from how Grand, Stan uh, Grand Canyon State Electric Cooperative partnered with a local Navajo reservation to provide masks and testing equipment. Let's take a look at her story. We donated face masks uh, to the Navajo Nation. We were also able to secure uh, COVID testing kits and offer those to uh, surrounding communities for our co-ops. So Hannah, um, tell us a little bit about where the idea generated to approach the reservation to offer your support. Yeah, of course. So. Um, our CEO, Dave Locke, and I, um, we realized that we had a surplus of face masks that were left over. Um, and our ECA actually helped us out a lot getting that initial order done. And uh, we sent them all out to our co-ops that we, we helped them get these masks. And uh, we actually sent more than they were expecting. And you know they were like, whoa, no, we're good. Uh, please don't send any more masks. We have more than enough. And uh, so, Dave and I were brainstorming, you know, like, who do we need to send this out to? Do we know of any local areas that we can do this? And uh, we're familiar with a, a utility that's up in uh, the Navajo Nation and services that surrounding area. And uh, we went online just to double check. And sure enough, the Cayenta Chapter House of Navajo Nation had sent out a request for face masks. And so uh, we called them up, talked to them on the phone and said, hey, you know, we, we want to donate to you guys 400 face masks we noticed that you guys had a uh, request and um, they were so appreciative and so thankful they asked for us to uh, send a picture of us with the masks um, and uh, so they could put that up on their community board just to thank us and uh, show the community you know who all's donated these masks which I thought was really cool but um, they were so excited and we we sent that shipment off and it went absolutely fantastic so we were really glad we could help them out what a great story. So um, I want to, so the audience right now, I hope that you have um, been inspired, but also kind of um, encouraged around the things that you could do in your community. And I want you right now to open that discussion tab, uh, the chat box uh, right here on the player. And I want you to just put in there right now, Cascade, let's get a waterfall of comments. I, know, I want you to use a word, maybe no more than two words, to describe how you feel or think, you know, about these stories. What is it 
inspired you? What is it about these stories that you found inspiring or how does it make you feel about that? And while you guys are putting that in the chat box, we're gonna do a little newlywed game with the panel. I asked our four panelists, I have not seen their responses, they have not shared it yet with each other, but um, I asked them to put one word, only one word to describe how they feel about their projects. Um, and guys, right now, can you on the count of three, hold up your one word, one, two, three, go. All right, so let's see, We could, Kyle has hope, Don has innovative, Hannah has honored, and Laura has blessed. Ah, such great words. So I know we're gonna see a lot of those same words right now in the chat box as well. But while, uh, while that's coming in, I really want to um, kind of just unpack some of this. So let's start with, uh, my first question really is, how did you get around some of the obstacles that showed up during the ideation and implementation of your project? Um, you know, can we, let's start with you, Don. You know, are there obstacles, you know, you had to get around? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, it's just about keeping everybody safe. And if, if, and you'll see that when we talk about all of our other ideas that we had, that you have to think we're inviting someone over to our, our place, we need to, to stay separated from them and make sure that uh, our folks were, were, were safe and they were safe because no matter what, we have to continue to do our job at Wake Electric, which is providing reliability. For those schools that, that are, are trying to teach our children uh, and, and keep the power on for the internet connections are, are for folks. So uh, I really think it's, it's when, we, when I met Dean, it was very obvious to both of us that there needed to be a, a social distance at, at all times to make sure that we were doing this safely when we were giving the donations out, as I'm sure the other panelists would say was a top priority too, because everybody, it, this all requires some sort of interaction. And, and that's what we're all about when we when we join this community it's we're going to be interacting with people and the and the top priority was safety i i know don said you know safety was a, a big thing but um you know, for us too, we wanted to make sure that our co-ops were taken care of as well but we know that you know, very familiar with the the co-op mindset that, you know, during crisis times, it is really hard to, to secure those resources and uh, to make sure that our communities are protected. And we absolutely wanted to make sure that um, if we could help another area, that we could do that for them, we could help them secure those those resources for them as well. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure everybody was very familiar with, uh, you know, shipping was a little slower um, last year as well. And yeah. that was kind of another thing we wanted to make sure that that those face masks got to the right place, um, but that they also got to the right place in the right amount of time. So uh, just, you know, tracking was was great. Thankfully, we didn't lose any shipping tracking. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, other than that, I think, um, you know, thankfully our obstacles weren't, um, I guess, you know, quite as large as, as some others might have been. Right. So I can, uh, I know there was tremendous goodwill generated, right, in uh, the communities that all four of you um, touched. But I'm curious to learn, what did these projects do for the morale of your coworkers, of your, of your um, you know, of the team that you work with? Because I there must have been tremendous um, a morale boost, especially during a time when people were really, I'm struggling when our whole world, you know, whole world was struggling, and and Kyle, um, you know, I, I you kind of touched on a little bit even with it with the project that uh, you were on, of course, um, tremendous goodwill and and morale booster. But to be, you know, let's let's kind of unpack that a little bit around the rest of the story, you know, like so so some of these projects were started six seven months ago. How is that? How has that impacted morale? Who wants to take that first? Yeah, I'll go with that one. I mean, in Ohio, for instance, I think it, I think this pandemic, none of us were prepared for, for the level that this pandemic and the amount of, you know, challenges that it was going to put in front of us. I think for us in Ohio, it, it just really helped us because we, we made it home from Guatemala when it looked uncertain that we were going to get out of there. 
and I think that put a lot of faith in, in our in our senior staffs and, and all of our co-ops across the board here in Ohio that that we were going to work together to get through this no matter what happened. I mean, we just went through one of the most uncertain times, and now we come right back, and you feel like you can take a deep breath. But honestly, when we got off the plane and – in Miami, it was like, okay, we're, we're, we're jumping from one frying pan into another. We were just getting home, getting back on the ground, understanding truly what this pandemic was doing to, um, to our abilities to provide electricity, to keep, our, to keep our workers safe, to keep their membership safe with our interaction. Because as co-ops, we interact so much with our communities. And, and I think it just gave us the ground and the traction we needed to know that no matter what happens, we're going to work together and we're going to get through this. And, and we have, I mean, and it's helped us on the, the training side to keep our training program going, to keep the apprentices trained, to keep our journeymen trained. Cause you know, safety is not taking a side seat during this pandemic. So um, <laughs> nor can we, but I think it gave us a lot of, a lot of hope that we could get through this. And we have, we've done very well in Ohio with this for sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Don. I know. Yeah, I'll, I know I'll, that. I'll, he, oh, sorry, Don. <laughs> no, I, well, I was going to say that you know, when we when we change from and have to think out of the box because very few of us may uh, probably had strong policies on remote working and keeping everybody separated. That this pandemic had a opportunity to destroy the culture that we've spent so long establishing um, and, and, and destroy that, that sense of family that cooperatives typically have when we work together. So it's, it's these little community projects that emphasize it. And so I think from a morale standpoint, these are required in order for co-ops to just keep the culture alive that we've, we've worked so hard over the last 80 years to, to build. Yeah, absolutely. Laura, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say things got, you know, depressing uh, slightly around here because it's just, oh, we can't do this. We have to stay away. We have to work from home. We can't get connected, you know, and it, it weighed heavily on our employees. But then whenever things started popping up in social media, you know, we donated water bottles to the school and you see the school thanking us. Thank you, Barry Electric, for the hot spots. Thank you for water bottles. We were able to use... Um, also uh, that we had received through the sharing success program and donate those to the school and to see them using the money to purchase the sanitizing backpacks where they use schools, you know, they're a great morale boost. And it, it just kind of helped us all remember that we are all in this together and we just kept, uh, kept, kept the smiles on the faces here at the co-op. Hannah, were you able to measure the impact that your project uh, and outreach has had on, on your service community? I mean, you know, the rest of the story. Right, yeah, no, so we, um, you know, it's kind of like, how do you measure morale? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of real ways to measure it, but um, one thing that we did actually notice was that um, our social media engagement towards the the middle of COVID, I guess you could call it, um, the, our social media engagement was actually really high, um, where other areas might have seen a, a dip in um, the engagement that they had on their different platforms, we actually saw a quite a large uh, influx in our engagement. And um, like to Laura's point earlier that she was talking about, you know, our, it was crazy just to see the morale of, of everyone around us. Um, you know, it, it it came, yeah, it was really kind of a hard hit. COVID was a hard hit for all of us, but you know, um, our, our statewide office only has five employees and I know our co-ops were working extremely hard too, but it honestly became this mindset of, okay, so what do you need? What can I help you with too? You know, everybody was partnering together, helping each other out. And it was great when we started sharing these stories of just people lending a helping hand and trying to bring hope back to their communities. Um, just the amount of people People who love to see that and wanted to see that. And we, we saw that reflect in our social media engagement too. Awesome. That's good. And I think Laura, you did too, right? Yeah, we definitely did lots of positive feedback whenever the community sees that you're out there for the community and not just worrying about yourself. <laughs> yeah. And Don, you talked about, you know, going over to this VFW and seeing these, uh, this like generation span, right? Of people working together. 
did you did, did the rest of the co-op did people get to experience that or see that you know besides you not yet but it's uh, i took a lot i've been taking a lot of video lately because i realized the opportunity that i have and so i would uh, i would definitely give that advice to everybody um a few of us get to work on these projects, but all of them, need, all of us need to experience it. So, you know, record it, document it, and share it is very vital, I think, in these, these projects. Awesome. Great advice. So, Kyle, do you think it's important that NRECA resumes their international outreach? You know, vaccines are rolling out. I mean, hopefully we're going to be at herd immunity, hopefully, you know, uh, by this fall. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly hope that sooner than later that we can we can again extend the greatness of our of ourselves to to those that are less fortunate. I, there is so much to be gained and so much to be learned um, on these projects, and and really all we're doing is we're just paving the way for them the same way that others paved the way for us. I mean, when you look back at the Roosevelt administration, when they enacted the Rural Electrification Acts into America, I mean, our rural communities, they, they helped drive the economic engine of the United States. And, and these rural communities that we're helping in Guatemala and other places around the world through these NRECA international projects, I mean, we're giving them that ability to, to advance themselves beyond what they're capable of on their own. And they're deserving people. They are great people. And um, for us to be able to call ourselves the greatest country in the world, which I, I wholesomely believe we are, you're only great if you're able to bring others to your same level. And that's what these projects do. And that's what their meaningfulness is. And um, yeah, I look very much forward to the fact to the day when I when when other states like us in Ohio are able to go and and extend that outreach of greatness and, and make other people's um, lives a little bit better and, and, and move them up one more step up the ladder and make life a little easier for sure. Oh, awesome. So I, I know that um, what really fascinated me talking to you guys about what you've done, um, what you were able to be a part of with your, with your co-ops is this um, just really this, this teamwork and creativity, innovation that came out of that. Is there another? Is there other initiatives or projects besides the ones you just shared with us that you just want to call out that has also happened as a result of COVID and that maybe this got the ball rolling? I mean, does anybody have one they want to share that's, you know, we don't have a video on, but it's actually happening? Uh, well, I know that, uh, and I'll, I'll look at Kyle too on, on the screen, is that, and I know that Kyle, we, we're all trying to figure out the best way of promoting safety, safety training, uh, in a virtual environment. So we were, all the co-ops were very used to getting everybody in one room once a month and hitting a, tra a safety topic. And that hasn't happened for almost a year, but learning uh, of, of different ways to push safety uh, initiatives out to the remote uh, employees, I know is a big initiative for us. I'm sure it's for Kyle too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our department, um, Safety training and loss prevention. I mean, we we have been we have been very innovative. I mean, we've done virtual meetings with with line workers. I mean, and here at the Colt training facility, um, we have very strict protocols for the students when they come here. Um, you know, and then we're we're doing sanitation um, upgrades. Obviously, we're we're wiping the facilities down three times a day, um, even to the point where now all the caterers that come in with lunch that they're serving all the lunches. I mean, things have just changed. Um, and some for, for the better, I mean, without a doubt, others because we had to, um, you know, and even now we're to the point where we're looking at, you know, possible ways to, to keep our, our apprentices and those that come to Colt for training safe with COVID testing ahead of time and just really trying to be innovative because, again, like you said, um, safety, safety is the number one goal of everybody. I mean, we can't provide that safe, reliable electricity to our members if, if we don't have those um, still able and willing to be able to do it um, and healthy. And um, so for us, it's, it's been a big, a big movement for sure to keep safety on the forefront. And I think we've done a good job of that in Ohio for sure. And you we've know, done I'm, some, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 <laughs> I was just gonna say, we've done um, similar projects uh, 
in um, Arizona as well. I know uh, we have an education program that's in place that helps with our safety training. And, you know, moving in through the COVID season, like you guys have been talking, you can't really meet in person anymore. And so, uh, you know, we've adapted with that and the fact that uh, we have a, a new system in place that allows for virtual learning. And we were able to get some OSHA training and safety training that allowed for virtual learning online um, for our guys as well. So that way, you know, we may not be able to meet in person, but hey, we're going to try to offer as much as we can virtually for everybody to continue to stay safe. You know, I asked uh, the audience in the beginning to, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, really think about their silver lining, uh, you know, what what you know what has kind of been the un unexpected consequence you know of what we've been through i'd like to ask you guys what did you personally learn over the past year that you're taking with you into 21. you want to start don um sure well i i like i said earlier is that very few co-ops had policies that would cover how to do or, or procedures of how to do the things that we've done in the past 12 months and so when you think about all the interactions with the community i really think you, you have to kind of throw some of that out the window and say let's think out of the box and, and think about it in a whole new way because at this point wake electric still doesn't have a work from home policy but we, we have a, a, a pandemic response um, procedures now in place that, that are working. Um, so, you know, it's one of those that at, at certain times you really have to take what's given to you, think out of the box and, and recreate a, a, better, a better situation. Thank you. How about you, Laura? Uh, biggest thing I've probably learned uh, is, well, don't, be complacent, don't cower down whenever challenges are in front of you because you can make a huge impact if you'll just step out of your comfort zone and be aware of, you know, you can't give up and you can't just sit back and hope everything gets better. You've got to get out and make that difference yourself and lead by example. And I feel like our cooperative try uh, with a leadership role here, I tried to do that, try to not just sit back and be like, we're just going to wait and see if this gets better. This is a little bit much for us. And instead just say, hey, we're going to take control. We're, we've not done this before, but we're going we're gonna to help and make it as safe as we can. Awesome. Kyle? I, I think for me is just the idea of, um, of just teamwork, overall teamwork, a little grace for the situation that whether you like it or love it, you know, um, whether you hate it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, um, the bottom line is we're all in it together. Just having the grace to, to, to make it more than just about yourself, to, to look around and say that, you know, like I know for us here, 120 apprentices, the goal is to make sure the next week group comes in and they get the training they need to, and that any one of us could break this thing and we could sink. And that when everybody puts others around them above themselves, that that's really what I think that we've learned in Ohio. And what I'm going to take forward is that no matter what comes at us, if you're open minded, you can make it work. And the idea of saying we can't do this is not an option. Um, we found a way to do it. And I think that's one of the things that I'll carry with me for a long time is that when you think you can't, you find a way to. And um, you, you got two options in life. You can say, poor, poor me. Or you can say what's still in it for me, and I think what a lot of us have done around the country is we found what's in it for us, and uh, we've made it work. Awesome. And Hannah, how about you? Yeah, I, I think you know one thing that's um, really just stuck out to me is that co-ops are incredibly resilient, um, and I, I know we all knew that, but uh, I think just to to really see that practical application of how we really can just stick through it. I mean, I know Don kind of talked about it earlier, but um, it's just, it's amazing to see how we can just take a, a problem or something that's, you know, difficult and uh, pull together and, and that collaboration and, um, you know, cooperation among cooperatives, um, but uh, really just pull together and, um, you know, 
do the best that we can with the cards of, you know, the cards that we've been dealt. So it's been amazing to see the reality of the resiliency of these co-ops um, just through this whole time. Oh, you guys, um, I, I want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time to uh, share with us and for your roles in, in kind of helping to lead um, these initiatives in your community. And I think for on behalf of the entire NRECA family, um, we're this has just been a really inspiring session. And I personally have been really inspired by this. And um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you to your co-ops uh, for leading the way. And I want the audience now because um, you've got to be you've got to be inspired. There's so uh, many great words of wisdom that this that these four uh, colleagues of yours have shared. So I want you to jump into the discussion tab right now and uh, tell us what are you inspired to do? What action are you going to take? moving forward, maybe it's a personal action, maybe it's uh, an action you wanna take with your co-op. Um, you know, I think everybody's saying here, you know, we're, uh, there's such great opportunity to continue these partnerships. And I know many of you out there have done some really great things in your community uh, to support them during the past year. But as you go into 21, what are you gonna leave taking? You know, what are you gonna continue to do with that? So jump that into, drop that into chat. Let's get a cascade of comments going on ways and actions you wanna take as a result of this um, very, very inspiring session. So thank you, Kyle, Don, Hannah, and Laura, uh, so much for being with us. Um, it's been a thrill and I've really enjoyed um, getting to know you guys. So thank you so much. Thank so you. Um, thank you. with you bet. So listen, as we wrap up the session, don't miss your chance to play the scavenger hunt for major cash prizes at our expo. Um, there's still time to win. So head on over there at noon when we open. And, um, and remind, uh, I also want to remind you that our women in tech session is today at 1230.